last week I was talking about the seven deadly sins, and we won't go over them again, you know, but we'll I'll probably touch on them a little bit as we go along. But today uh, we'll be talking about the seven Christian virtues that overcome those seven deadly sins. And I, even though I, I, I guess I talked with them, talked to you about, about them a little bit last week, um, we're going to get in more detail about that. But let's let's get into some uh, definitions first, and then we'll get into the the rest of the study. <clears throat> a virtue, first of all, and I'm going to give you the, the the book definition, and I'll give you the layman's definition, as they say. A virtue is a an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. Grace is God's free gift of Himself, and virtue is man's free response to God. God gives us grace to live a virtuous life through the Holy Spirit. The goal of a virtuous life is through God, our Lord Jesus, God and our Lord Jesus Christ. One can share in His divine nature. In other words, the things that I do are a reflection of what's inside of me. You see, that's how we should be thinking. And a lot of people think if I do a lot of good things, I will become a good person. No, that, that does, does not work like that at all. In fact, if the Holy Spirit is in you and you are experiencing the grace of God, you can't help but want to do good things. They just come natural. And you do them without an expectation of anything in return. So it is a virtue. So if you, um, say for example, read your Bible daily, that's a virtue. But it's a good habit too, isn't it? We're, we're habitual people. You know, we're, we're, we're into a lot of habits. And, and um, the natural person that does not have God in their lives, they have some very bad habits, don't they? A lot of bad habits. And it's hard to get rid of those bad habits. But instead of you changing and getting rid of them yourself, once you experience the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, then God himself starts removing things out of your life. But there are some things that you and I can do in the process to help the Lord make us better people. And again, we want to caution anybody saying that we're good people. You know, we're not. We serve a good God. And maybe we do good things. But so long as we live in this flesh here, there, there's always that temptation. Remember the story of Jesus? They would they refer to him as good master. And he said, don't ever call me good. He says, there's only one that is good and it's God in heaven. But you know what? It's, in fact, I, I mentioned that myself you know, before. I know I've been a pastor for quite a few years, but I don't consider myself a good person. Uh, I do good things, hopefully, and God is pleased by them. But I only do them because... They are virtues of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. And the reason Jesus said that is because he was still living in that flesh. And he was tempted in everything we are tempted in. But he did not sin. That's a big difference. Now we do sin. Some of us give in to temptation and some of us do not. But the temptation is always there. And so long as you live in this body. In, that, um, in the Bible study we were uh, listening to a while ago, in this tent, the Bible says, in, in this house that we live in. And boy, it, it's, it's really tough, you know, and I'm so, I'm so grateful that, that Christ came to earth to walk in our shoes because he knows now more than ever what it's like to be us. And it's hard. It's very hard. Because sometimes we're in a good mood and sometimes we're in a bad mood. Sometimes we say good things. Sometimes we say bad things. Sometimes we do things that are pleasing to the Lord. And sometimes we please the devil. But so long as you and I allow the Lord to work on these 
weaknesses inside of us. And so long as we help him in this process, it's going to go a lot better for us throughout this life. Let's talk about, look at the very first uh, virtue, and it is ch called charity. Okay. Now, when you think about the word charity, I think if I were to ask, people would say, well, it's, it's me giving you stuff, you know, me going to the Salvation Army and giving them my old clothes or shoes. Or maybe me giving people that are poor money or something, right? That's what we think about as charity. But that's not what the Bible calls charity. In fact, charity is love. Charity leads us to love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus Christ calls this the greatest commandment of all. Matthew 22, 37, 39. Don't think I have to read that one right now because I think all of us remember that very clearly. The chief commandment, the greatest commandment is to love. Why? Because God is love, isn't he? God is love above all things. In fact, he loves far better than you and I ever will. I wish we could love the way the Lord lo loves. We tend to love people that love us. We tend to love people that do good things to us. And we hate people that are mean. We hate people that oppose us, people that talk to us badly. But Jesus died for them just like he died for us while we were yet sinners. It's another verse that I want to look at in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. So. And I'm going to get, get into that subject a little bit more next week because you know what? You and I are here today and you and I are trying to be faithful because, because not because we're good folks, but because God called us to do this. We are here because of God's calling. Isn't that an honor? Isn't that a tremendous blessing? But you know what? If he calls us according to his purpose, then that means to imply there are some people he does not call. And I'm going to get into that next week when we get into more on in that subject about the calling of the Lord. But one of the things that we need to understand, everything that we do, it has to be done with love. You remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter? If I do anything at all, even if I sacrifice my body to the flames, the Bible says, if I don't do it out of love, I am nothing. It's a waste of time. In fact, a lot of terrorists, they blow themselves up because they think they're pleasing Allah. How in the world could God be blessed if you blow yourself up and blow other people too? No, I don't think they are serving the same God you and I serve. You know, and, and I, I might get people get angry with me and in a different um, environment, Allah wants you to die for him. But God has died for me. You see the big difference there? There is a tremendous difference there. Why? Because the God that you and I love is a, is a God of love. He does everything that he has done for us out of love. And we don't deserve any of the grace that he offers. We don't deserve any, any of the wonderful blessings we receive. And I'm so grateful for having been called. I got to tell you, I, when, when, when people are called into ministry, as I did in the past, we do it reluctantly because, well, there's a lot of work here. It's hard. And I'm not really sure this is going to be a fun time. And it's not fun at all. And for some of us, the pay is terrible. But the important thing is we are serving God. And when we do this out of love, and I think Stan mentioned that earlier this, this morning. Yeah, he and I do this out of love. You know, we don't do this for pay. We don't do this because we want to have somebody pat us on the back. No, 
I, I just have a responsibility from the Lord. And what I do is a reflection of the love that God offers me. And I, I got to be telling you, I don't think it's good enough. I really don't. But I think God is pleased because at least I'm trying. I'm trying to, to do things out of love. And when I do that, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. I think it pleases the Lord. So charity is one of the greatest of all virtues that we're going to be talking about. So we want to start off with the very best one. And if you want to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, just like I mentioned a while ago, you can. It is a love chapter and it's one of my favorites. <clears throat> For it inspires and informs all other virtues. In Colossians 3.14, it says, and, all, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So every virtue that we have, Everything that we do that is a, of any good, if you do it out of love, it, it, it magnifies itself. It becomes something very special. And, and I think it, it's, it, it, it's really humbling experience to know that we're doing something that pleases God and touches people's lives. If you want to read more about some Bible examples... Uh, I will leave those up there for a minute. And then if you want to look at this uh, um, sermon upload later on, you sure can, you know, on trueheartofworship.org. <clears throat> but there's some biblical examples of how God has expressed his love in, in Genesis and in Numbers. But Jesus was all about love too, wasn't he? Matthew and John talks about that. Mary a wonderful example of love. A lot of times she didn't quite understand why things were happening the way they were. And yet she pondered all these things in her heart, didn't she? And she just loved the Lord with all her heart. And I think she was privileged above all women to have given Christ that birth. And we don't celebrate the birth of Christ, you know, like some people have been in the past. You know, we, we won't get into all that Christmas stuff today. But it is a very uh, a pagan holiday, as you know. And I decide not to get into that this year. But I might next year if we get different people that don't know the truth. But the point was that I think the greatest gift of all was not the birth of Christ. Because, you know, what he existed in a spiritual since before he always lived he's alpha and omega he always he, the beginning and the end he always was and he always will be the greatest gift of all from the lord was not his birth but his death because when he died you and i had a chance to live eternity and isn't that a wonderful thing so the greatest gift of all is his death and that's the big one. That's the most important thing. And we will focus more on that in the days to come, in the years to come, I'm sure. But remember, we only have seven virtues to cover. So when I get too close to seven, you know I'm wrapping it up. But I, I, I want to make sure that we get enough understanding about this. The second one is faith. Um, I always tell people I, I hated my name because it was Joe. That's a very boring name, you know, Joe or Joseph, you know. But then later on, I looked it up, what Joseph really meant. And it means increasing faith. And I said, I think I like that. I think I like that. So thank you, Mom, for that one. But faith is the belief and a personal commitment to God and to his saving truths. We serve a God that we have never seen at all. But we feel him, don't we? It's, it's hard to really explain it to somebody. It's kind of like um, uh, I had this experience of trying to teach this young man in, my, in one of my classes. I, I teach a lot of classes with special needs kids, you know. And, and uh, Ruby was, some of, was in some of my classes, by the way, you know, because he's also special needs. But I had some special needs kids, and one of them was blind. 
try to imagine what it was like for me to explain to him what blue was. And I said, okay, 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 Bob, you need to set up this website this way. And so you, you, you do this and you do that, but make sure you use a color blue. And he said, he's just stopped for a minute. He says, I don't know what that is. Oh, you've never seen before? He says, no, I was born blind and I've never seen blue before. And I said, how do I explain to him the color blue? That's kind of like trying to explain to an unbeliever what faith is in, in a God that we have not seen is like. You see? So I said to him, blue is column three, row five. And he goes, oh, that's all I need to know. So from that point, whenever I told him to color something, I say, uh, that's purple, and that's going to be on, on column three, row seven, or something or other, you know. So that's all he needed to know. And so when I try to explain my faith in God, it's like trying to explain to a blind man what color is like. And all I can tell you is God is someone that I feel in my life. God that I feel moving within me, driving me, encouraging me, filling me up. We just heard the story about the living water. And I, I was thinking about that. And I was, th I, I was thinking about mentioning something there about that. But when the Holy Spirit is inside you, really that is the, ab the abiding of, of God inside of us, isn't it? It is God dwelling in us. You see? So every time I call on the Lord, especially when I'm in my darkest moments, then I feel him inside me. I feel him warming me up. I feel him filling me up. I feel him moving within me. And that is what faith in a God that I cannot see is like. And I think some of you might have your own personal stories about that. And hopefully... And hopefully you, you um, have experienced something wonderful like that. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith, so this is the biblical uh, definition. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And it's tough to have faith. It really is. Faith is also believing in things you do not see. And I've never seen God. You know, and uh, in fact, the Bible says, no man has ever seen God and lived. So uh, if you want to die early, that's on you. You know, if you then probably ask God, well, let me see you, God, so that you can, you can leave early, I suppose, you know. But Romans 1, 17 says, having faith in God leads us to truth. For he is truth itself. The more one is committed to faith in God, the more fruitful one's life will be. For the righteous shall live by faith. See, if you're going to be righteous, you have to live by faith. And you got to have faith, you know. And we have faith in our little church that it is all going to work out for the best. I, I, I know the other church is going through a lot of difficult times. You know, because I get it, I still talk with them quite a bit, you know, because they're, they're still part of my congregation, you know. So I have not forgotten about them, you know, because I brought them to the Lord and married most of them and baptized them. But I'm glad that 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 the Lord is is driving them through faith as he is driving us as well. Okay. But some good examples of faith is found in Noah. Can you imagine Noah building an ark because it was going to rain? And if you read that chapter carefully, it had never rained before. Boy, he must have looked like a laughing stock to people, right, when he did that. But he did it, and boy, they weren't laughing when they were drowning, that's for sure. Abraham was told, I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your, your country. 
I want you to leave everything behind and then go to a place that I will tell you about later. No plans, no map, <clears throat> certainly no GPS back then. He had no idea where he was going, but he headed out with just the basic belongings. And he was rewarded for that faith, right? We don't know where we're going either. But you know what? I trust God. And I believe in the Lord. And he's still working on us, you know, and he will continue to work among us. There's also Rahab, the prostitute. Remember her? And she had faith that if she just helped these people out, that they would spare her family. And she had heard stories, horror stories, about how they had destroyed a lot of people that opposed them. But she had faith that God could forgive her and God could use her. And he did. Because if you go look back at the lineage of Jesus, Rahab was there. Wow, what an honor to, do, to be part of the lineage of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That is a reward in itself, I think. And, of course, Moses. Moses, of course, you know, leading the people to the promised land that he never got to see, except for a little bit of peak up from that mountain. But he trusted the Lord. And the Lord was the only person, or at least the very first, that God actually buried. You know, so that's interesting how that worked out for him. The number three, the, or the third, virtue is hope. Okay, hope. Hope is a desire for God and the trust we will receive the, gra receive the graces to be with him for eternity in heaven. I, I threw that in as, as a definition <clears throat> by mankind, <clears throat> but I agree with, with Stan. We're not going to heaven, but there's some sins. Uh, there, there's some, uh, you know, uh, truth in it because the reward from the Lord is coming from heaven, isn't it? The, the, the building that he's going to be building for us is being created in heaven. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my house are many mansions, he said. So he's going to prepare a place for us. And we have hope in that. We have faith in that. Psalms 31, 24 says, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So, so long as we have hope, so long as we have confidence in something greater than ourselves, and don't trust in yourself. I don't trust in me, but I trust in God. And so long, because, you know, if, and if, and if you ever trust more in man than God, you're going to be very disappointed one day. I was always trying to get my mom to come to our church years ago. But she says, I can't leave my pastor. He said, she said, I can't leave him. He's such a young man. He's such a wonderful guy. And I said, you should be following the Lord, not, not this guy. Yeah, but she did what she did back then. And long story short, he blew town. He left. He abandoned her. And I said, well, where is your, your pastor? You're going to go follow him from state to state now? She says, don't be mean. Sometimes I, I would kid her. Actually, she and I had a really good a relationship that we kidded each other all the time. But hope sustains us in times of difficulty and keeps us from discouragement. Jesus Christ is the actual fulfillment of our hope. Paul reminds us, in hope, were we saved? Of Romans 8, 24. One hopes for God's mercy, prayer, is the expression of our hope. I, I have hope. And I think all of us should pray every morning and every time we go to bed. Don't just say, thank you, Jesus, for this food and let me have it. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be a good communication between you and the Lord. And there should be no fancy words to be used just speak from the heart i know when i have touched the lord because i feel he is pleased 
And when he's pleased, he makes me feel good. Okay? But let us not give up hope. Even if the world stops doing the right things. Even if the world goes crazy. Our hope is not in this world. It's not in this government. It's not in people. It is in God. You see, if you put your, your hope on, in people, they'll eventually let you down. And, and they do, you know. But my hope is in the Lord. And so long as I have hope in him, I will not be discouraged. There are a lot of big, good biblical examples. Think about Job still having hope, even after he lost his family, his home, and all his livestock and everything. Jeremiah had hope, even though nobody was converted. Boy, I, I, he would refer to as a weeping prophet. Because he wept over the people that he was trying to preach to. They didn't want to hear it. In fact, some of them threw him in a hole one time, you know, and, and, and uh, try to kill him that way. Uh, sometimes a, 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 a pastor that preaches the truth, they, they, just, they just get so worn out sometimes, you know, because people don't want to hear the truth anymore. If you just keep telling people what they want to hear, they will never be changed. They will never be converted. And we will let the Lord down for sure. But be aware that hope sustains us in times of difficulty. And wasn't this the most difficult year that we had in 2020? That was a, one of the toughest ones. I've had illnesses. I had injuries and I've had all kinds of crazy things happen and the threat of COVID, a lot of things going on there, right? And I'm sure some of you have experienced a lot of difficult things, you know? I think a lot of us have family that were touched by COVID. I, I had a nephew and a niece that were touched by it. And so it's a scary thing, you know, it's a very real thing. The other one is temperance. Number four, temperance. What is temperance? Temperance is a mortal, the moral virtue that gives us self-control over our desires and appetites. It could be for food. It could be for something else. And it could be a lot of material things too. In order to live godly and upright lives in this world. Uh, this is the opposite of the other uh, deadly sin, isn't it? Gluttony. Uh, there's some, has anybody ever heard of the term gluten intolerance, right? That's where they got gluttony from. Gluten is actually a, a, an actual uh, chemical that they put in bread to, to make it thicker and, and make it rise better, Okay. And uh, unfortunately, some of us can't tolerate it. I can't very much, so I, I, I try to stay away from it too much. But the gluttony that people are uh, have, as far as sin is concerned, is they eat more than they need to, okay? They eat more than they need to, and sometimes they, their uh, gluttony is uh, is manifested in maybe taking alcohol to extent, maybe drugs, or maybe just doing a lot of overdoing a lot of things. You got to set some time aside for the Lord. You can have gluttony in watching too much TV all day. You know that'd be crazy. But if you got to leave time for the Lord, you really do. And temperance is a way to do that. So if you don't have temperance, make sure you ask the Lord for that. Temperance defends the inner soul and serenity of the moral person from all the seductions of the world, the flesh, and the devil. If a person is weak and has a low temperance or the inability to say no. You know, when they're out of control and they're overeating, they're probably out of control in a lot of other things. 
you got to be careful about that. They can be out of control in a lot of other things, not just food. So show me a person that overeats and I'll show you a person that's probably out of control in a lot of other things too. So we got to be careful about that, you know. We got to be careful and and seek the Lord's spiritual uh gift of temperance so that we can actually know how to defend ourselves from the wiles of the devil. Any the, the Lord uh doesn't help you with this because you don't ask him. Think about it. The enemy is going to use that as a foothold to destroy you. But temperance gives one control over instincts. And so he helps us to resist temptations. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. See, we're going back to that. You know, so every time you hear the word water in a lot of the verses, it's probably not just water you drink, but the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of us, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we cannot share it with other people. We need to do that. We need to share the Holy Spirit with other people. And so if you ever want to resist temptation and have self-control, the fruit of the Holy Spirit will provide temperance if you ask the Lord. The Lord will never impose himself on us. He's never going to say, I'm taking over. You don't know what you're doing. No, he waits on us to ask that perfect prayer. And a lot of us suffer from lack of self-control. But little by little, we start giving in to the Lord and trusting in the Lord. And he will help us be overcome all these weaknesses that we may have. Good biblical examples is Joseph. He was tempted by this, uh, this woman, you know, that... That, that her uh, employer had, you know, and she was trying to seduce him. But you know what? He had self-control because of the Holy Spirit was part of him. And Daniel, you know, even though he was thrown into a, the lion's den and later on into the fire, he has self-control because he prayed. The Bible says that he prayed three times a day. Most of us just prayed maybe once if we're lucky, maybe a little hurried up prayer. But the Lord knows that we need to pray more often. He needs to hear from us. You know how I know, and I don't know if maybe you felt this before, how I know that I should be praying at this moment. I feel like a sense of um, insecurity, uneasiness, or weakness. And I feel... You know what? I need to call on God. I think he's pushing my buttons. And he doesn't have to push me very hard. I listen to him. And then I call out on him. And I realize we connect it. And I'm able to have that fruit of the Holy Spirit once again. The fifth virtue is humility. You remember the opposite is pride. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. If you humble yourself, the Lord will lift us up and extend us grace. So let's look at a definition for that. And a lot of these definitions, are not my, in fact, most of them are not mine, but, you know, things that I looked up in the dictionary as Stan does itself too. doesn't mean I completely agree with them, but, you know, I'll pick out what I believe. Humility is often characterized as a genuine gratitude and lack of arrogance, a modest view of oneself. However, the biblical definition of humility goes beyond this. That's for sure. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about that one, right? Because that's the most important thing. Humility is a critical and continuous emphasis of godliness in the Bible as we are called upon to be humble followers of Christ and trust in the wisdom and salvation of God. Everything you and I have comes from God. What did Job say? Naked I came into this earth and naked I will go. You can't take it with you. But the only thing you can take is the good works you left behind. Hopefully you will have left some good ones behind. 
But James 4 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And there's other verses that are going to be, that we'll look at in a minute. But the thing is, I, I have to remember even everything I have comes from God. It belongs to the Lord. And, I, and I'm, I'm happy to say that. I didn't, uh, any gift that I have, maybe these skills or talents I have, I can't really be um, immodest or proud about it. Because it came from God, you know, and everything that I, that you and I have, he gives you so that you can take care of yourself and your family, but also serve the Lord as well. So don't ever get around to thinking there's nothing that I can do. I don't have those skills and talents, but you know what? The Lord will, has given you talents already. Maybe you have not looked at them very clearly. But the best example is Jesus in humility. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 7 says, Have this mind among yourself which is in yours, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Can you imagine humility that Jesus had? That he allowed people to beat him up and to, and, and to crucify him and to hurt him? That is one of the, the, the most humbling things to do. Here is a king. Here is the son of God. Here is someone who is our savior. And yet, he took the form that looked a lot like us. He hurt like us. He wasn't bulletproof or immune of anything. So, if you stop to think about it, if he was just as human as we were, and he was tempted just like us, and he had all these other weaknesses, and he hurt just like us, Think about it. He might have gotten sick sometimes. He might have hadn't gotten cold. He might have felt hunger. He might have felt weakness. He might have felt sad and depressed at times. He did. He knows everything we feel. So you and I now have an advocate in the Father, so that we can come to Him and say. Lord, you know what I'm going through because you've been there in my shoes. And I'm just asking you in prayer to help me to become a better person day by day. And the Lord will give us that when we humble ourselves. So he gives grace to the humble. So in humility, remember, nothing you have belongs to you. Even your family belongs to God. Even your house, your car. Everything you have comes from the Lord. So what have you got to be proud of? Any skills or talents or abilities were, were built on things that the Lord already put inside you. So don't brag about anything like that, okay? I'm just as equal to the housekeeper that, that cleans my office. And anybody else that I work with, because you know what? They are children of God, just like I am. We're, uh, and none of us are better than anybody else. Here's the sixth one, though. And I think all of us can do a lot more of this. And that is kindness. Okay? To have kindness in our heart. Kindness is centrally part of the nature of God. And how do we know that? Because in the book of Psalms, it refers to God's kindness 80 times. Boy, he must have really been serious about that. God refers to himself as kind or being good, okay? So we can't be good because of our own self, but we can do offer kindness to people and we can do good things. 
I like to think they were doing some good things today. So kindness is a very important nature of the Lord. And we need to show kindness to other people as well. But kindness is not a duty or an ethic either. It is an expression of the personal virtue that flows from and is rooted in love, which is at the heart of all virtue. So kindness comes through us if God is living in us. Because God is kind, you see. And if God loves us and we feel God's love, we can actually love other people as well. Even if they did, did us some wrong. Even if they hurt us. And all of us have been hurt before, haven't we? All of us have been hurt before. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and some of us in different ways and some worse than others, you know. But God knows that if we are kind to other people, he becomes more kind to us. But I'm kind to other people, not because I'm kind myself, but because it is a virtue that God puts inside of me that is rooted in his love. Okay? It is rooted in the love of God. And that is an expression of the love that God has in me. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So I have to forgive people. The Lord has told me that. And all of us have to forgive people. And some people have offended us. And we, we mentioned that before. But forgive one another. Somebody once said to me, I have not forgiven that person yet. Because you know what? They have not asked forgiveness. And I'm not going to talk to that person because that person offended me and they have not asked forgiveness. But what does the Bible say about that? The Bible says if your brother has offended you, go to your brother or sister. Make your peace with them. And maybe you will win them back. That's the opposite of, of what the flesh thinks, isn't it? Because if if, if we're going to operate by the, by the will of the flesh, we're going to say, I'm going to be kind to only people that are nice to me. And anybody that is mean to me, I'm going to ignore them. That's not what the Bible says. Just as the Lord has been kind, tenderhearted to us and kind to us, we need to forgive others when they offend us. And I'm not telling you it's an easy thing. And maybe... It would not be a bad thing to say, you know what, I'm telling you that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to forgive you even though you have not asked forgiveness. But I want you to know you, you hurt me because of this and that. But I'm okay with you and hopefully that won't happen anymore. Maybe that would be a good approach, I guess. But the best example of kindness is Jesus, isn't it? He healed and he touched the lepers. Whenever, you, whenever people saw people uh, with leprosy, what would they do? Get around that guy. He's dirty. Don't touch him. Right? Don't even look at them. Don't even touch them. Jesus not only kneeled and touched them, but he healed them as well. Isn't that a good act of kindness? And some people would have said, oh, that guy's dirty. Why are you touching him? You know? But Jesus led by example, and he showed his kindness through this leper. He also dined with sinners. Some people say, what's he doing with all those drunks over there? What's he doing with those people that, that never come to the synagogue? People that are not saved. If he was such a smart guy, he would know better not to hang around with them. He should only hang around with the nice guys. He should only hang around with Christians or believers. But that's not what Jesus did. He dined with the sinners. And I'm sure he told little stories and parables. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful to hear what he was telling them? They must have been astonished that there he was, somebody of his stature, 
sitting with them and talking with them. He preached to the Samaritan woman by the well. Some people said, if he knew who she was and he was such a good prophet, he would not even look at her. But in fact, he talked to her about water from the, that spiritual water. Didn't he? Go, this is, goes back to what we were talking about in, this, in the Sabbath school. But he preached to this woman, the Samaritan woman, and she was so grateful. And what was this so, so unique and different? Because you need to understand who Samaritans were. Some of you probably know, but in case you don't, a Samaritan is a person that was part uh, Gentile and part Jewish. Okay? So you might think, well, better than nothing, at least he's half Jew, you know? No, it doesn't work like that. If, if you were half Jewish, the Jews didn't like you. Okay? Because you had some Gentile in you. And if you were part Gentile but and part Jewish, the Gentiles wouldn't like you either because they said, you've got some Jew in you. We don't like you either. That was rough, being uh, of a mixed race, you see. But what does that tell us there? Jesus loved everybody. He didn't care about their race. He was not as impressed by, by any of that at all. He showed kindness to her. And he... Uh, I'm sure saved quite a few Samaritans while he was on earth. But the greatest act of kindness is that he forgave those that hurt him and crucified him. What did Jesus say? And there's a, there's a lot more involved with that, but the gist of it was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. How many of us would want to ask people, to, uh, a God to forgive these people? that were torturing us, not just giving us a hard time, but actually torturing us. But he forgave them, didn't he? And he loved them. And I wonder how many of them repented afterwards. But here's the interesting thing. That's not the question that we should be asking. Because a lot of people will say, but if I forgave that person, did that person get saved? Did that person become a good person? No, it has nothing to do with what happens to them? It has to do what happens to you. What happens to us? I forgive them in spite of the fact that they don't want forgiveness. And that's what kindness is all about. I forgive them even though they might still be mean to me. Think about that. that that's kind of hard to do. So not just because he forgave them, that doesn't mean they became good people. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But the fact is, it wasn't on him. He expressed his kindness. So here's the final one, the seventh one. And that is patience. Brother Ernie Bergman would, uh, would often say, you know, he was my mentor when I was started off in my ministry long ago. It is good to have a good mentor, and I'm, I'm hoping someday the Lord will send a young man that I can mentor to take my place. You know, that's, I'm not thinking about doing this till from the grave, you know, but um, I'm, I'm doing it because I, I believe that um, the Lord is still using me. But Ernie Bergman would say, God give me patience and give it to me now, he would say. Of course, that's a bit of a joke, because if you think about it, you know, he sure must have needed patience there, you know. But patience, then, is forbearance or in endurance. In the former sense, it is a quality of self-restraint or of not giving way to anger. Even in the face of provocation, it is attributed to both God and man. And it is closely related to mercy and compassion. So forbearance, by the way, is a pretty fancy word. But really what that means is they owe you something. Partly because maybe it's financial or maybe it's because they did something to offend you. But you're not going to punish them or get even with them. That's what forbearance is basically it in a gist. Endurance is putting up with people, having patience with them, 
And sometimes you can get on your nerves. I'll talk to you about some of my special needs students, you know. Can you imagine having 25 of them at one time? Oh, God, they, they really stretch my patience. But I believe that God uh, gave me that job for that reason so that I can actually become more patient as a pastor as well. So patience is a heavenly virtue. So wonderful virtue. Here's a verse that goes with it in James chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. So temptation comes from the flesh. It comes from the devil. It comes from the world. It's always going to be there. So long as you and I live in this life, we will suffer temptation. But with patience, we can overcome it. And I think that's one of the things that I inherited from my mom. Uh, uh, her patience. She had a lot of patience with people, you know. And, and I, I think I learned that. And patience doesn't come naturally. You got it. You got to work on that, you know. And the way that we work, we get patience. It, and, and if you ever ask God, and here's you got to be careful about this. If you ever ask God for greater patience, be careful what you're asking for. Because you know what you're asking him for? God, test me more. God, give me more trials. Because in those trials, you will receive patience. You will learn patience. Show me a person that is very patient, and I will show you a person that has endured a lot of trials, a lot of testing, and a lot of temptation. You see, God may not tempt you, but he doesn't mind testing you a little bit, you know. And he will allow that to happen so that you can develop this patience. And what does the Bible say about this? What, what else does it say? By your patience, you possess your very souls. Luke 21, 19. So the Lord wants us to be patient. He wants us to endure. And Jesus and, and also Joseph were one of the great examples of what patience was all about. And I, I know that these are the seven virtues. And I, I know there are other virtues there. But um, I just picked out seven of the best ones that really touched my heart. And I believe that if we have all these seven virtues... We're going to get through life a lot better. We really are. And just remember, we are all a work in progress. And we are still, God is still working on us. And I know that he that endures to the very end, uh, the Lord will say, you know, if we endure to the very end, because uh, we will always be tempted and tried. So, I'll just give you a heads up of what we're going to be talking about next. We're going to go off in a little bit of a, a, a different corner, a di direction. We're going to be talking about the secret sensitive church. Uh, so it's going off a little bit of a different tangent there. I did a lot of studying on that. Uh, be, knowing that, and I, th I guess I should have known about that, you know, because we came from a secret sensitive church. You know, I didn't know. Until I started hearing the buzzwords, and I'll give you some of the buzzwords later on. But a secret sensitive church, uh, you know, is, is com compromising with other people. Trying to win them over and letting them get away with murder practically. And don't even expect them to change because we don't want to get them mad. We want to love on them and love on them because they are seeking the Lord. Not true. Most people are not seeking God. And that's a sad story, you know, and that we'll talk about that next week. I don't want to get too far into that. But I did want to cover, uh, because I was talking about the seven deadly sins, I thought I should talk about the seven, you know, uh, heavenly virtues as well. But we're going to be talking about some different role uh, church models that are out there. And this is one of the scariest ones. 
And there's a lot of Church of Gods that are using the sensor, secret sensitive church model. And uh, I've never ascribed to it. And uh, and I, I think uh, they kind of kind of pulled a fast one on us, you know, didn't realize what was going on with that. But, oh, well, better late than never, learning the truth as we go. But we'll get more into that, you know, just heads up what we'll be talking about next week about what secret sensitive church and the kind of church that God really wants us to have. Let me close with the word of prayer. And I think that Stan's probably got a, a hymn to close us out. And so we can just sort of uh, sign off eventually. But let us bow our heads for now. Thank you, Lord, for this time you've given us to be together as your people. I pray, Lord, that you will give us more of these virtues. But we need to be able to do all these things and have all these virtues in our lives so that we can overcome the deadly sins that are in this flesh. Forgive us, Father. We all know that we're weak people. We are not worthy of, to be called children of God. But you extend grace, Lord, for those of us that humble ourselves before you and seek you with all our heart. And so we ask that you will bless us and you will bless all your people that really want to serve you, that really want to follow after you. We ask that you will abide with all your people this day who have really sought this rest from the Lord. And so we ask that you be with us the rest of this day of rest that you will empower us with your Holy Spirit, that you will be with us, not just this day, this Sabbath day, but every day of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.